Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Thank you for the invitation, y'all. Good to see you guys. Gosh, I'm in San Francisco. I thought I thought maybe we might have been in person, and I totally get it. I'm access to Zen isn't isn't back in person either, and um, I'm sorry to hear about Paul's passing. Yeah, Paul, is that correct? Yes. It's hard to see the picture. Can you hold it up a little more? Okay. All right. Ah, oh, gosh. Um, I'll, I'll start out by telling you guys a story. So recently I was um, co-leading a LGBTQ to a, no, a IA 2S plus, right? We added some more uh, letters and numbers there since the last time I taught there. And um, obviously it was an affinity retreat. And um, so at that center, they asked, they have residents who live there who manage the retreat. And when it's a specific affinity retreat, they ask for the residents who are not a member of that affinity to um, not be part of the retreat. And part of the benefit of, uh, they're all volunteers at the center. So part of the benefit of living there is that you get you know, teachings and you get to be um, in the morning sit every day and hear the Dharma talks when there's a retreat. And so they were not part of that. And part of my job as the teacher is also to interact with the residents, including, you know, having breakfast with them every day and then providing practice discussions. And so I had one with someone who expressed to me. So the thing, you know, that came up in the <laughs> breakfast a lot was questioning. There were all these people questioning if they were indeed LGBTQIA, blah, 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 right? And I will say that, um, I should say actually, that when I started the retreat and, you know, we do this like circle, and I was like, I have to tell you guys, almost, I think 40 years now, I've been out as a lesbian, but I'm gonna come out again with a they. Right? And I've been holding this whole, because as you notice, I'm now she, they, and if you guys even remember, other times I've been on here, I've been she, her. And I've been, you know, kind of holding this they for a while since, um, you know, for a few years now when the, um, when the, ex I would say the explosion of the possibilities and the inclusiveness of that, um, they're more than the binary gender. I mean, I know it's been in, in the world and in our, our community for a long time. And it's become much more, you know, since we've all started pro putting pronouns on Zoom and stuff, right? And, and, you know, to be perfectly honest, when I first did it, I thought, hey, I'm a they because I'm gender non-conforming. But then there was the whole thing about Oh, no, is it really a, a trans thing, uh, tra you know, an identity for transgender people? And so am I, you know, part of that whole appropriation, co-opting kind of thing. So I've been kind of not quite sure. And I had, was there for a while, then I took it away. And um, so anyway, so then I, I did. And I said, I, to me, I'm, I'm going to really hold this gender non-conforming as, as part. And I think, again, it's part of the whole community of discussion in which I think it's been more clarified, you know, more and more. So what, like, to be honest, gender queer is still kind of vague for me. What, what does that mean exactly, right? So, so I did come out in that sense. And then, um, so anyways, I was having this discussion with this uh, resident and they were like, you know, I'm questioning. And, and it's because in part, I'm like, 
do you know most of my friends are queer most of my friends you know that I have Dharma discussion with are too and you know I, w I would just feel like I could just benefit a lot from a retreat like this so so what do you think is it okay that I'm questioning and I'm like yeah I think it's it's fine and it sounds like you're questioning and I celebrate that and and oh and I will you know and to me it was more that they were like well I would like to come to this kind of retreat you know and um I'm like I, I think I, th I think wow I think it's great that at least in the Bay Area and the United States culture in general, in general, um, we have really expanded the sense of the possibility of, you know, being able to be queer, to be um, non-binary, you know, um, we have a kind of like a niece in our family. Um, by that, I just mean not blood <laughs> niece. Um, so that, you know, recently we are in discussion with what is their, they're the 20, and what is their, um, you know, sexual orientation. And so we said, are you queer? Are you bisexual? How do you identify? And this young uh, person was like, well, we don't call ourselves those. We're pansexual. That's and the 20 year old in the Bay Area, that's the that's the word now. And you know, and I live to, you know, queer nation and all that. So, you know, so so there's this really sense that like the society in the United States in the Bay Area has really expanded and there's a lot of freedom to identify ourselves in different ways. And I celebrate that, I do. And I was talking to this person and I said, but you know that, or and you know, that um, it isn't just the freedom to identify. Right? Again, I celebrate it. And are you willing, do you understand that it comes from an oppression? That are you willing to be identify as one of us if they ever come for us, which they have historically? So for oppressed groups, it is the freedom from hatred that we are talking about when we take on identity in a way that's open and affirming, right? So to me, it really brought up this very different sense, whereas mostly in, you know, when we think about freedom in the United States, we talk about, I have the freedom to, I should have the freedom to, love whoever I want, you know, and I'm putting it in that framing, right? Buy whatever coffee I want, wear whatever jeans I want, do this, do that, right? I should have the freedom too. And again, I celebrate that. And our practice, especially as Buddhists, in my opinion, is that we're practicing for freedom from, right? freedom from clinging, of course, it's the main thing. And from an oppressed position is the freedom from hatred. This is where I think it's really important to name ourselves from the community. And there's a whole different thing when it's part of being a community oppressed that defines itself. So one one so that's been really something that's like I've talked about freedom to and freedom from before, but I really kind of really thought of this as this is what we're doing. And so I want to offer you to you guys today um, skillful effort from the Eightfold Path as ways to work with freedom to and freedom from. So as many of you probably know, the Eightfold Path, of course, is um, the fourth of the four noble truths. Do I need to go through them briefly? Should I? Okay, classically, or actually I will give you my engaged version because it goes with it. The first is, since it's a restorative model, the, the engaged Four Noble Truths, um, we begin by saying that in life there's harm and harming. Hmm? We just take it on as true. Hmm? 
and then the second is um, usually is you know and it is not it's similar with the classic which is that there are causes and conditions for the rising of dukkha or harm and harming third is that there's actually um, agency in the midst of hurt and harm classically the third noble truth is that the end of suffering is possible or the or the causes and conditions for dukkha can be ended alleviated and ended and then the fourth of course is the eightfold path and the eightfold path is broken into th three sections or the eight of them there are three sections and first is the wisdom which is uh, so right again classically it's right right as in complete or whole or perfected uh, more recently the the word that's been used more is wise or skillful and I'm gonna go with skillful because to me it implies both what is skillful and how to be skillful which I think is the, the greatness of the Eightfold path is that it's both descriptive and prescriptive right it says this is what it is and this is how you can do that and we're, we're gonna meet that in the skillful effort so again skillful wisdom is uh, the three gr groupings are wisdom, classically in this order, wisdom, ethical conduct, and then uh, the samadhi or the meditative third. So the first third is skillful view or understanding, which is to understand the Four Noble Truths and to understand karma. Mm -hmm. uh, the second aspect of that and that is skillful thinking, and in Buddhism, thinking is very much purposive, so a better translation these days is skillful intention, or I myself prefer skillful motivation, right? So that's the wisdom. So this is how you frame your life, right? That you're understanding the world. In Buddhism, as a Four Noble Truth, as understanding karma, cause and effect, and to understand that our thinking is purposive. It's the drive towards the second third, which is the ethical conduct, or I like to say the compassionate connection third, because it tells us how to behave with each other, which is skillful speech, skillful action, and skillful living or skillful livelihood. And the third grouping is skillful effort, skillful mindfulness, and skillful concentration. Now while it's put here as a third, um, often it's actually considered the bridge between the wisdom aspect and the ethical aspect. Because in meditation, what we do is we say, oh, am I living, am I behaving, the ethical conduct, in accordance with my values? And perhaps sometimes my values need to change to be in accordance with how we interact. And in some ways, this is how we can understand as this, this expansion of the sense of gender, and, and sexual orientation as that the values of society has shifted to meet the actual living experience. Right? So this is, and in meditation as, as individuals, we, we are balancing out or harmonizing. Am I living in accordance to my value and am I acting in a way that reflects my value? Does that make sense? Okay, now skillful effort is technically in the meditative quality because it is usually talked about um, as ways to work with your meditation. And it's first in that because skillful effort um, is towards, are you being skillful towards your motivation? So it goes back to actually the wisdom third. Are you living, excuse me, are you meditating or is your meditation practice in accordance with the Four Noble Truths and understanding karma and is it understanding that how you think your motivation really works, right? So in skillful effort, um, you could frame it as, am I using the energy as I effort in a way that's in accordance with my values or in accordance with understanding um, what's important in life? And of course in Buddhism, um, what's important is, um, whether, so in the skillful effort, there are four ways to work with your effort. And let me go ahead, maybe I should tell you first a little bit more about skillful effort. Let's see, meditative quality, meditation, yeah, okay. All right, so 
skillful effort is in accordance with understanding the four noble truths and your motivation maybe i should pause and say skillful thinking or motivation is two groupings <laughs> love these groupings in buddhism okay first is that the buddha noticed that when you're in the quality of your thinking or your mind there are two one is what's classically called the unwholesome right which is thoughts of um greed thoughts of ill will and thoughts of hatred sometimes even to the point of violence and then the other grouping is the antidote to those so the antidote to greed is renunciation the antidote to ill will is metta or goodwill and the antidote to hatred is karuna or compassion okay so switch to skillful effort remember it really is the the bridge between your values and your action so in skillful effort we're practicing to the skillful and skillful effort is towards renunciation towards ill will excuse me goodwill and towards compassion is that clear okay so that's what's wholesome then in skillful effort or skillful okay and so they're also broken up into what's wholesome and unwholesome. So therefore, many of you probably have heard of them. Um, when it is unskillful or unwholesome, you want to prevent it from arising. And once it has arisen, you want to abandon it. I'm going to give you a, a thing in chat in a minute, but let me just say them. If the effort is deemed skillful, and then you, and then it hasn't arisen, then you want to cultivate it to arise. And if it is already skillful, that's present, then you want to extend it. Okay. So I, um, in the classic teaching, it's usually prevent, abandon. I can't remember what C is and A. I made up the acronym PACE. That's what I just said to you all. Here, I'll put it in here. Sorry, the, the, P is for prevent, A is for abandon, C is for cultivate, E is for extend. And maybe I have a shorter version here. It doesn't come out so well from my paper to, oh, here it is, to chat. All right. So pace works out. So I want to really say that what we'll, we'll define here in terms of what I'm talking about today as the unskillful, when unskillful is, is about hatred, we're talking about oppression here, and specifically as, you know, homophobia, heterosexism, all right, um, gender oppression. Okay, so for instance, we come to affinity groups as a prevention. When you say so of course in anything that could be dependent sometimes you're preventing sometimes you're cultivating but so just follow this with me broadly right so in, in a sense don't you come to affinity like today you come to this group and you're all regulars you come here because on a sunday you can choose some other sangha to go to but you come here because there's already some sense that's going to be a prevention from homophobia Right? What did you say? Am I just talking to myself? Okay, thank you. Some response. Okay, so that's a kind of prevention hmm? uh, in terms of being queer. We go to queer bars as a prevention. Hmm? Uh, so we go to the Castro, hopefully, as a sense of prevention. Right? So these are preventing from hatred that's already out there against us. Hmm? Now, once unskillful has arisen, I think abandoned on a certain level we would think much more as i would say as internalized homophobia how do i prevent that from you know when i hear myself talk to myself in a certain way in a way taking on the they for me is abandoning that sense that i have to conform to being a she or a he Right? I'm abandoning the language of the dichotomy of the binary, right? That we have to be one or the other. I'll put in my name. 
I renamed myself with a territory. This is a prevention, excuse me, an abandoning of, under, of understanding that this land was free and gotten by Christopher Columbus and the, the rest of us, right? When really this is a kind of abandoning of the sense of imperialism, colonializing. We, we telling a truth to abandon untruth. Yeah. Cultivate the wholesome or the skillful when it's not already here. The best way, I think, is the antidote here of hatred, which is karuna. And that's why I wanted to give you some of that in the meditation. And just to remind you, right, the phrases are about how do we work with our pain and suffering? How do we bring tenderness to it? How do we forgive ourselves and others? Remember, if it, we were doing the whole thing, we would be sending it to others. All right. I see that, um, let's see here. Mike is basically cultivating Paul's presence here this time, right? And as a reminder to us, right? So, I will say, let me just say a little bit more about compassion because it is, I think, you know, sometimes we think, oh, compassion, la, 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 so great. We should just learn to, you know, be kinder to each other or something. And really, um, it's a hard practice, compassion, because fundamentally, compassion in the Buddhist sense is the wish and the practices to alleviate and end suffering. Well, that's huge. It's not just to, to feel good about ourselves. So that's part of it. And I think as oppressed people, we do need it to, to use it as a way, as a bomb, as a salve for, for the hatred that we've internalized. And that's why I just did the I in the meditation. Here's from Gil in Cultivating Compassion. He writes, Gil Fronstone, sorry, one of my teachers. Compassion is a form of empathy and care that wishes for the alleviation of someone's suffering. Instead, it's possible to actively, excuse me, it's possible to actively develop our feelings of compassion and remove the obstacles of our, of, for, excuse me, for feeling compassionate. Let me just read that sentence again because I really messed it up. Compassion is a form of empathy and care that wishes for the alleviation of someone's suffering. It's possible to actively develop our feelings of compassion and remove the obstacles for our feeling compassionate. Because people sometimes confuse compassion with feelings of distress. It's helpful to clear, clearly distinguish the two. Compassion doesn't make us victims of suffering, whereas feeling of distress on another's behalf often does. Learning how to see the suffering in the world without taking it on personally is very important. When we take it personally, it is easy to become depressed or burdened. We can avoid taking it as a personal burden or obligation if we learn to feel empathy without it touching our own fear, attachment, and perhaps unresolved grief. This means that to feel greater compassion for others, we need to understand our own suffering. And really this has come to what I really think about that. Our f a function, you know, as many of you know, I deal with social justice a lot. So what I've been thinking also about is that depending on our location in the system of oppression and domination, our function and how we work with the hatred is very different. When we're, when we're in the down power position, of an oppression, for instance, being queer and homophobia and heterosexism and gender oppression, then um, our, our, our task really, not, not exclusively, and I think it's totally key and important, is to heal from the hatred that we've experienced, some of the impact of the oppression. And so the individual practice of how to be free from hatred is really important. If we're in the upper power position, for instance, I'm generally able body and the up power and in, in um, ability oppression, then I 
my function then is to practice to heal the structure that is oppressive around ability. Does that make sense? So one function or responsibility changes as the condition changes. So, and I think that in practicing to overcome our the hatred of impact on our on us as oppressed people, um, that's how we get more settled so that we can help others. Right? This is how you know, and I think you guys have small groups, I think I remember, right? And I don't know, I don't know. And then I presume part of your asking if there are new people, I remember when we used to meet in person, is maybe, maybe some of you would, you know, actively go seek out the new people afterward, because in, this is a kind of, um, you know, what did you use the word, big brother, in a good sense, for, you know, like, for someone who's new to the community, because I would, I would imagine that, you know, being called um, gay Buddhist fellowship that there might be some people coming out and some people really questioning and working with their gender identity who would come to you all and so you would kind of mentor them, right? I, I would think that that would be part of things. So this is a kind of cultivation practice also. It could also take us to the, um, the last one which is E is to extend. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when a skillful is already present, then we want to figure out how to extend that. Okay. Um, let's go down here. I would say that when I'm more settle in having healed or our healing, I don't know if there's an end point, to the internalized hatred and the, or the, and the impact of structural oppression, in this case, uh, homophobia, that I would hope that my practice would be to figure out how to extend the safety and the protection for others. And also in my presence as being settled about who I am in the world and the comfortableness, you know, helps to extend that. I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm starting to feel, you know, older now for sure, but you know, like seemingly on one level, I, to be perfectly honest, I'm really kind of jealous of all these youngins that are like, oh, we're pansexual, we're, you know, like, being whatever is just so easy for everyone. And I remember the days when it was really hard, I thought, to come out. And I'm not, I'm not denying that it's still hard for, for some people. Really, I, I'm not. And so, and I remember that, you know, I, I still occasionally people will reach out to me who's like, I don't know if you remember, but, you know, when we were in high school or college together, when you were out, you really supported me to be to understand that being a lesbian was okay. And now I've come out too, and I just wanted to let you know. You know, you guys probably have experienced things like that. So that's a kind of be, being ourselves, loving ourselves as we are, being patient with ourselves, taking on this identity and building fellowship, literally in your case, right, is a way to extend Right, the skillfulness of overcoming hatred. All right, let me finish with um, Gil in the same. It says, compassion is inextricably linked to the Buddhist practice of liberation. It can be the motivation for this practice as well as the result. As one's inner freedom grows, one capacity for compassion increases. As one compassion increases, so does the importance of freedom. Liberation supports compassion and compassion supports liberation. They both benefit when they go hand in hand. Thank you for your attention. All right. you really want to open it up for any thoughts, ideas about this? And you guys know I take challenges. Clint, are you talking? You're muted.
Clint, did you want to say something? You can nod and maybe. Oh, oh, oh me. I'm sorry. No, you're talking to me. Oh, no, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I thought you were talking. You were muted. No, I, uh, I, I no, I, I, the talk was wonderful, but I, I don't have a question. Okay. It's good to see you. Likewise. Yeah. Jeff's hand is up. Jeff, yeah. Hi, right from the end. Hey. Thank you for your talk. I appreciated especially your distinction between when we feel compassion for someone suffering that we we are hoping to re that they have the relief from suffering rather than compassion being our distress about their the suffering. I think that's a, a, a pitfall that a lot of caregivers get into is uh, Feeling, all oh, my friends all have COVID, or my friend lost her ability to walk, or and that is sad. Uh, but it, you know, I think it's good to be reminded of the, the root in uh, wanting to, her suffering to be alleviated. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, and I'll, I'll just reference that it was Gills, so it's a good distinction he brought up. Thank you, though. All right, Bob, I was going to say, are any stories about a P or A or C or an E? You want to just share stories, too. That works. Well, it's not that. Um, you were mentioning about all the letters of, and numbers of the alphabet that are describing so many different identities that people are trying to get respect for. At least I think that's what they're doing. But I guess I'm simplistic. If I respect who you are without labeling how you label yourself, is that wrong? Is that a negative? I accept you. You can define yourself however you want, in whatever location, in whatever circumstances. And I just accept it without giving it a label. Is that, am I being silly, naive? I don't know. Uh, um, Bob, I want to take it. So you're saying when you accept it without what? Without prejudice without um, without judgment. Mm -hmm. People identify, you know, I remember when we talked about the rainbow mm -hmm. and now people are trying to put different colors into the rainbow and the rainbow sure. was meant to say everyone. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to stick with that concept of the rainbow is everyone. I don't know if we need so many different to identify so many different colors in the rainbow. Mm -hmm. We just accept everyone, except I accept how you are. I accept how he is and she is and they are. I don't, and I don't even have to say whether it's he, she, or they. I accept you without judgment. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's the distinction I'm trying to make, Bob, which is that I think it's a very different thing to say it. I'm okay with things as it is, and people can have the freedom to be whoever they want to be. I think it's a different thing when we think of it in terms of systems of oppressions. Then in a structure sense, then is this how, how is there freedom from? And just as we took back the word queer as a way to affirm queerness and not be, and not take, have it be a word that is derogatory, this is the broad sense of queer nation, right? So that was to, for us saying an identity does matter. And what I call myself needs to be accepted in a bigger sense. And so that's a freedom from hatred in that movement. And so I think when people want to be included in the, you know, or, or expand, is a better word, expand the binary, say, of gender of she and her, he only, um, then that's a, a asking to remember that there's more here. And also, to be perfectly honest, for me, as a Buddhist, it just reminds us that there's so many variation. And in fact, for, 
we're practicing to open actually to more definition of what is suffering for others and for ourselves because i know i i've expanded my sense of what i thought is suffering for myself and the irony i think in, in buddhist practice is that when we can expand that it actually we suffer less it's kind of like that sense you know when you open up there's going to be more it's almost like we open up a window of tolerance you know that expression right from trauma and when we open up our ability to be inclusive of more and more difficulties of more and more definitions of more and more of what is helpful to be part of the whole right then it actually benefits us all because then we can just accept each other this is the difficulty right is that people don't just accept each other and that's why we have we need to expand it so that people feel included who hasn't felt included before just like i know it you know i i had another story i was going to tell which i didn't tell but you know well maybe i'll just say briefly here which was in the late 90s i was with a lesbian asian lesbian group potluck group so you guys go ahead and laugh yep lesbian potlucks yep and we met you know i can't remember once a month or something and they're all asian lesbians right so then it started i think someone someone who these days might be a, a they um you know it's like i think i think it was me actually i brought like a mango mango like jelly thing but i had added something in it and so it just took it up a notch uh, you know i said i'm a foodie took it up a notch and when someone said oh can marry because so many asian parents want wouldn't accept you being out right like they everyone in the family your extended family know that you're a lesbian but you just don't talk about it right and then they keep wanting you to when are you going to get married like it's just the big thing and we all are working within that and so it's kind of like this inside joke you know like your mother say oh can marry right because now you're marriageable because you can cook a decent dish you know totally stupid you know from from the lesbian point of view for sure and yet it became this in joke so that we could you know like like a I think a cultivation of of um, from hatred is, you know, this is why you have inside jokes, why you have humor that works from inside the community that doesn't work outside. You know, like if someone said that to me from the outside, I'd be like, fuck you. But, you know, from from ourselves, it becomes this in joke because we're we're overcoming that oppression in a way that expands its meaning to more than what it has been imputed on us. And I think that's really key. Right. And so again, as a when we see it from a system, or when we in a, a position of power, then 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 it's useful to remember. Oh yeah, the the people who want to be included haven't felt included. And so if we do, I, my, myself, Bob, I think if I if I am really okay with how they want to identify me, then what is another color on the rainbow? Because you know, maybe when we expand our sense of these days for real right of our sight we might be able to see brown and black on the fucking rainbow i don't know bob but i think it's possible right and white you know you might see a lot more colors in the rainbow than our than what what right now our visual eyes can see does that answer your question or or meets it you're you're muted again well I'll just briefly mention everyone knows I was a social worker at San Francisco General Ward 86 and for a decade or so. And when I would sit down with someone, they would walk into the room and I would just accept them immediately, encourage them to start talking and whatever they said was okay. And that's where we started. We started where they were, everything was accepted and we went from there, there was no judgment. And I think I, I would love that we could all just accept others without judgment. Maybe I'm being too idealistic or naive. Um, 
Well, I think that's a great aspiration, but Anne, I'm, my guess is that it took a lot of work to get that unit put together, and there were people outside the unit who didn't agree with that. And I, my guess is, as a social worker, being one myself, that you probably advocate it. I mean, this is the thing. Interpersonal relationship is one thing. I could say I accept you however you are. But when we leave that space and systems of oppressions, like hospitals, right, and other institution, come on, we have to work to have certain units. We have to work to have certain acceptance of what is defined. Who gets to go in and see somebody when they're sick, for fucking goodness sake? So, do you know, it's a very, this is why we have to, we have to see it beyond just an interpersonal. I mean, I think it's lovely as an interpersonal, and certainly that's part of our practice. And, and our practice, I think, as Buddhists, is where it works really well with being a social worker, too, is that it's about how do we make it more and more inclusive. Can I move on? Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. All right, Risha, I think you were first, and then Mike. Thank you so much. Um, I love Buddhism because it has all these lists, and, uh, and I like your PACE acronym. Thank you for that. Um, and I like to, I like how you apply it to daily living, um, because sometimes that's hard for me to take the poly words and the theories and the lists and think, well, what does that mean for today? And, um, I'm really latching on to extend, mm. um, because, uh, you know, and I like the challenge of the, the, you know, the, um, pronouns too, because, um, I know some people are really kind of against it or really for it. And, uh, and, you know, I have friends in like, especially in 12 step groups when we're in and people are renaming themselves and we'll be like in our text message being like, well, my pronouns are girl, 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 or something like that, just to be, to joke about it, you know, but like, it's a challenge that fa the thoughts that come up are not like lovey, lovey acceptance automatically. So I have to extend and I have to band abandon those and extend it like if you want that then you know you deserve it kind of thing and like i who am i to say get over myself um i'm trying i don't know if these thoughts are going to connect but like i recently have had a couple of friends who transitioned genders mm -hmm. and so i now have a more close eye view of what it's like to change your gender and what it's like to feel like truly accepted in the way that you want to be accepted even though like me old school queer from the gay bars and the drag queens is like you know uh i i have a certain response like emotional mental response to that that i have to i need to abandon and extend into something else and um and one of the things i did over the summer i downloaded from the new york times this list of the 100 greatest gay novels and i started reading them while i was on vacation in barcelona and had covid and um it was like, oh God, I forgot that that's what people went through. You know, like they were all these tales of, this is like homo fiction, oppression, get married anyway, hide, sneak into the bathroom, sneak into the woods, you know, like the way that life used to be. And because of what activism happened before I was born or right after I was born, I don't have to go through that. And so it feels like it's just another extension of that now. Like we are we are evolving more and more and more. And it challenges my self-righteous indignation, which I've learned is one of my strongest character defects. Like it's, you know, I know how everything should be. <laughs> um, it's just a challenge. So I really appreciate the idea of like when I get a thought, I'm going to say to myself, ooh, let's abandon that. And let's extend compassion and extend extend myself like I just it feels weird to um to accept that this thing that this person wants you know I don't know I don't know how, anyway I run into it not just with pronouns but like with just the way people behave the way people you see on the streets walking through you know being in San Francisco I live right off of Polk Street and there's so much blight right now and I just hit it with these like uh you know, visceral responses that I don't want to have. I want to abandon them. I want to extend compassion. I don't even know what it looks like. But anyway, I'm blathering on. So thank you for your talk. It, it kind of opened up my thinking.
Great, thank you. I don't think I need to say anything. Thank you. I, I'm glad it works for you, and I appreciate your examples of extending. Mike. Oh, thank you for your talk. Yeah, I just want to make a couple of observations and raise a question. Um, I not only lived through the early days of gay liberation and uh, not way back when they had the California Hall, they had the busted parties and not in the 60s, but early 70s and the Harvey Milk time and the post-Harvey Milk and AIDS. I actually was uh, in Ward 5A myself in the early 90s a couple of times. But getting back to uh, relevance of three different uh, pandemics, I guess I'll use that word. I don't know how it applies to all of them and how they relate to our community. Uh, the one, the most impactful one for the world was COVID, which is not specific to our community. It's anybody got it. Lots of people who were not gay had it and people still have it. But the other two were AIDS, which I survived. My partner didn't, and Paul did not die of AIDS. Uh, he had the virus, he did not die of it. But uh, my lover did, and I survived it. And uh, the spiritual essence for that, and I wanted you to comment also on monkeypox, because it's spreading among gay men. And I have judgments about it, um, the lessons, and I have my ideas about what we, quote unquote, should learn from it. And yet, you know, I'm not going to share those because we all have our own. Anyway, if you want to comment on the role of uh, these various so-called pandemics and how we can learn from the suffering. Thank you. Gosh, I'm not sure. I'm kind of broad, Mike. Sorry, I mean, I'm not really always so, very focused with my questions, but do you, what, what are you thinking anymore about uh, what our... Um, what our struggles will be around uh, the latest one, which is monkeypox, which is affecting a lot of, not maybe lesbians, but a lot of gay men, uh, even from hugging or from long-term sleeping together, just cuddling, uh, which is an experience many of us have, even older, we may not be even very sexually active, but still cuddle a lot. Thank you. Well, one, I will say that, um Probably most of the people in the other rectangles are, are, would be better at addressing this than myself, being a lesbian. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, I think that the, the things we learned from surviving the AIDS crisis and from the pandemic, and, I, and on one level, I will say, maybe I'll just say this, and this, maybe I'll be like, I'm not sure it all connects it. It connects in my mind. Let's see if it connects in your you all's mind. One, you know, when, when stuff started to come out about smallpox, um, and, and I, I will admit that I, I, I've been writing, my book will come out next August. Um, <laughs> uh, so I've been at Russian River and um, a lot, which is, and, and, you know, my girlfriend, you know, just being funny is calling me a river monk. And so I've been a little bit isolated. And so I'll, I'll admit to that. So I don't listen to the news a lot and stuff because I'm just writing. Um, and when it's so when this information starts to come out, you know, I have I have a lot of social justice friends here and they're like, oh, why are they framing us, you know, just a, a, a homosexual and, you know, by men thing. And, you know, is that being, you know, doing this oppression kind of thing in the media and I said well it, you know possibly and, and you know the media will will do that and I know that during the AIDS crisis uh, the, the the queer community really wanted more and more medical information and that was part of a fight it was like get the fucking information to us right and so and um, having worked for the Department of Public Health as a contractor as a, a, a social worker in San Francisco a few years ago now or over 10 years ago now or 10 years ago now um I know you know I trust the San Francisco system a, a lot more than others and um I think that it so so the the data from San Francisco on one level I could trust more and then tr two um because of that experience about not getting enough information I just want to make sure that you know the gay community is getting enough information and that vaccines and whatever is needed. So 
on that, I think we can learn from, hopefully, I, honestly, maybe because I'm a social worker, I think my, my, my thing is always thinking, how do we work so that different systems will give us the information we need, give us the medication we need, give us the support we need. And, um, and so my work is always about coalition building and, and connecting to people who have power to, to affect how we get care. Um, so hopefully anything we learn from the AIDS crisis and on a certain level, perhaps not to frame it as just a, a gay issue because it is affecting other people. And that's how, you know, when, when people realize that it's going to affect them too, then they're more willing to put resources behind it. So I don't know. I don't know if that supports you. Yes, go for it. Well, I just want to add that uh, I guess the main thing is compassion to get over the fear. Uh, as we know, during AIDS, many caregivers at first some wouldn't even enter the room if somebody had AIDS wow. before they knew how to spread and to get past the fear of getting monkeypox from somebody because I'm, I, I'm a little afraid of that hugging somebody holding their hand more than two minutes or something there's no, there's no time on it, whatever but I mean I'm a little afraid of it but but it's like uh, just being careful I mean we can still wear gloves and disgusting as that sounds, we can still do that if we're worried about it, but we can still hug, we can still cuddle, we can still wear masks or COVID, et cetera. Just learn how to love each other despite all these things that seem to happen. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Maybe the only thing I'll add to that is, I think part of compassion, which I had down, but I didn't want to, I felt like I was trying to, I do want to have conversation with you all. So I think the hardest thing about compassion is actually to be with our own fear. And you and you brought it up. And I'm not so sure about being, getting over it because, I don't know, it's hard to get over anything. In my, in my business, that's what, that's why I have a business, teaching, letting go, essentially. Um, and so um, to me, the, the easiest, oh, I don't know, easiest, the the hardest and certainly to me the most efficacious response is that how do we go to meet fear and i think part of how we meet fear is that we're open about it and so admitting to being afraid being able to talk to each other about it and then to come up together with you know this is hopefully what we learn. i mean hopefully what we learned from the aids crisis what we learned from being queers so what we we, you know, on a certain level, the more and more, you know, I think us oppressed people have it all because we had limited, you know, structure to tell us how to be. Well, the, a lot of structure told us how to be, and we had to make our own in so many ways. And a lot of that has to do, go, okay, well, this, this works for me. How does that work for you? And so hopefully we had more communication about it. And I think that's always a good thing uh, to define for ourselves. What what is fear here? What are the things I'm afraid about? How do we meet this together? How do we overcome it together? How do we negotiate it together? Um, I think those are those are skills that applies um, in all conditions, and especially challenging ones. I think that's that's the key, right? Is how do we stay open to being vulnerable, to saying I'm scared, I don't know what to do, and then to to certainly trying and 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 um. And that's why we also need really clear information so that we don't pass on. I think maybe our big, the big difference maybe from the AIDS crisis is that information just goes to the fucking internet so fast. Sorry, I keep swearing. I'm trying to practice, but um, you know, it goes through so fast, and there's so much misinformation out there that if anything, you know, to actually make sure we get correct or or more up to date and clear information so that we can. We can um, negotiate and, and conversate together.